shows the unity of 30,000 educators standing strong to put business in its place out of our schools. Corporate America sees K-12 public education as a $380 billion trust that up until the last 10 or 15 years, they haven't had a sizable piece of. So this so-called school reform is not an education plan. It's a business plan, then standardized tests, which in this town alone is a $60 million business. Measured that slow death by starvation. That was the newly elected Chicago Teachers Union President Karen Lewis announcing a revolt. Teachers and the Department of Education are in a battle. Now remember, these are overwhelmingly Democratic voters. They and their unions turned out en masse to elect Obama in 2008. Now, teachers unions like that are not even inviting the Education Secretary, Arne Duncan, to their meetings. And they're up in arms about Race to the Top, a White House education initiative that Obama has called one of his proudest achievements. At issue, of course, funding. Education's not seeing the hand-over-fist growth that we've seen in quote-unquote intelligence these past nine years. And now Congress is facing what looks like a choice between funding race to the top policies or basic school budgets. Here to talk about it is Diane Ravitch. She is not only a contributor to The Nation magazine, but also a research professor at NYU and the author of a brand new book, The Death and Life of the Great American School System. It's reviewed at thenation.com too. Welcome to the program, so glad to have you. Thank you for having me. To give people a little bit of your background, you were a research assistant secretary of education for George W. Bush. You were all behind, no child left behind. What were your hopes? Well, I uh, served as Assistant Secretary for Research in the first Bush administration. Uh, I supported charter schools. I testified in the New York State Legislature for the first charter school law in the state. Uh, I supported No Child Left Behind. I was not one of its architects, uh, but I did support it because I hoped, as I think most Democrats and Republicans hoped, that it would lead to improvement. Uh, but what's happened to me over the past few years is that I kept looking at the evidence and the evidence was that uh, charter schools and testing and accountability were having a lot of negative consequences for children and also for public education. And I came to the conclusion that the combination of No Child Left Behind with its uh, utopian rhetoric about 100% of all children will be proficient was actually leading to a lowering of standards and setting up public education to be privatized. Mm. So talk about where that policy and some of the assumptions behind it were wrong. Because on its face, you're right. The ideas were supported by many, right. not just those firmly in the conservative camp. There are three basic assumptions, if you can help us go through it. One, that scores have something to do with education. Two, that you can shame schools into doing better. And three, that, well, three really is the idea that testing reflects educational achievement, per right. se. The, the, the first idea, and that is that testing, uh, or it's actually the first and third idea, is testing the same as education. And when you get test results, you're really getting an accurate reflection of ch children being well educated. And I came to realize the answer is, is no, no, and absolutely not. Mm -hmm. Because what the testing emphasis has actually done to American schools has been to narrow the curriculum. Uh, there, when you s say that testing in reading and math counts, uh, that your salary, that your uh, tenure, that your, your evaluation will be based on reading and math scores, then teachers are incentivized to give less attention to the arts and history and literature and geography and foreign languages and science and everything else uh, other than reading and math. It, it's inevitable. Uh, and so by all of this emphasis on reading and math scores, we're actually, we've created this multi-billion dollar testing industry. Kids are learning to take tests they're not actually learning reading and they're not actually learning math. We see this in, uh, for instance, college remediation rates, which have not gone down at all. And uh, the flat reading scores on the federal tests that are given every other year, the uh, eighth grade scores have been flat since 1998. So the, the results have been meager and the effect on education has been, uh, in my view, very, very bad. Well, maybe the, the, really the third point there is that the idea was that scores, if they were low, reflected poor teaching. And as you point out in your book, you came to realize, actually it has more to do with poor people. 
Well, uh, yes. I mean, if, if there is any sort of strong new idea that Obama and Duncan have brought to this whole discussion, it's that if the scores are low, the teachers should be blamed. And that was not explicit in No Child Left Behind, but they have made this a cornerstone of their program. And it becomes very, very, they say that they're not anti-teacher. Their rhetoric is very anti-teacher. Uh, when both the secretary and the president saluted and hailed uh, the firing of the entire staff at Central Falls High School in Rhode Island, that sent a message to every teacher in America. And uh, because my email is on my website, I get emails every day from teachers saying that the testing is driving them nuts, that they have less time for everything. Uh, and that this is not good education. And there, from what I've seen from having traveled the country these past few months, there is tremendous demoralization amongst the people that we count on to teach our kids. Mm -hmm. For a taste of that rhetoric, his, uh, his Barack Obama, I was going to say George Bush, whoops, <laughs> talking about his education policy and his program race to the top, which, as I said, he's called one of his proudest achievements. This is from earlier this year. And here's how race to the top works. Last year, we set aside more than $4 billion to improve our schools, one of the largest investments in reform in our nation's history. But we didn't just hand this money out to states that wanted it. We challenged them to compete for it. And it's the competitive nature of this initiative that we believe helps make it so effective. We laid out a few key criteria and said, if you meet these tests, we'll reward you by helping you reform your schools. You mentioned one distinction in the Obama program um, from what preceded it. Are there others? Are, are, these, are these different programs, different policies, really? Well, Obama's program is firmly rooted in No Child Left Behind. And I think one of the reasons that teachers are so depressed is they believe that Obama represented change and hope. And their idea of change and hope was he'll get rid of No Child Left Behind. He'll recognize that the most important thing that's holding back kids from performing well in school is poverty and, and not knowing English and being homeless and the transiency of their families and all these other issues that uh, affect children's ability to do well in school. But instead, he has taken this race to the top, which is really, in my view, an odious program. Uh, first of all, to compete, uh, states are asked to increase the number of privately managed charter schools, uh, which the research shows are not better than public schools on the whole. Uh, and secondly, they're asked to judge teachers by test scores, uh, and the test scores will be in reading and math. And this is for uh, a million reasons, which I could elaborate, a terrible idea. the third part of race, The third part of the race at the top, which comes right out of No Child Left Behind, is if you're not making, if the school is at the bottom, if they're not making progress, close the school, turn it into a char charter school, privatize the management, fire the principal, fire the staff, all very punitive measures. Would they improve education? Though? No, no, none of these will improve education. The, uh, what I show in, in Chapter 7 of my book is that the research on charter schools to this date shows that they're no better than regular public schools. The media likes to fasten on one fabulous charter school, not noticing the attrition rate, not, as, not noticing how many kids got removed. Uh, but charter schools don't do better on the whole than regular public schools. And here's, here's an example none of, of these will improve education. Here's an example of a, a classic or typical kind of report on charter schools in New Orleans, which has been a big sort of test case for charter school supporters. Take a look. Since the post-Katrina takeover, the school system in Orleans Parish has been radically transformed. This year, 61% of our students go to charter schools. We project next year will be 70%. Unlike traditional public schools, charter schools are autonomous entities that aren't hindered by collective bargaining agreements or bureaucratic red tape. If you're in a charter school, there's no longer tenure, and the charter schools have total control of the time, people, and money. I think that we do have really talented people on staff that have great ideas, and to be able to implement those right away, just as long as you know our whole team is on board and not have to get approval from a larger bureaucracy, just means that progress can happen faster. Unhindered, not beleaguered. Sounds great. Well, the uh, basic recipe in New Orleans is this. Wipe out public education wipe out the unions, and the schools will get better. What they've actually done in New Orleans is to create a bifurcated system 
in which uh, 60%, 60, she said 61% of the kids are in charters, the other 39% of the kids are the very lowest performing kids. Now maybe they'll be able to pick off enough to bring them up to 65%, maybe they might even make 70. But they basically said to the low performing kids, you stay in that old system, we don't want you. And so they're able to raise their scores. I mean, this really just reinforces what I've been saying in the book and also in this interview, yeah. which is that if you can, it, it's the kids who are the poorest, the kids who are the neediest, who have the low scores, and you have to address the root causes of why they're not performing. But uh, what the charter schools do, and, and it's not just in New Orleans, but in uh, many cities, is that they skim. They skim in the poorest communities. They, don't, they have lower percentages of kids who are limited English proficient. They ha don't have the kids who have the most severe disabilities. Uh, they don't have ho very many homeless kids. You can just go on and on yeah. with the categories. And by, by not taking their fair share of those kids, they have higher scores. One of the reviewers of your book in The Nation said that he perceived a parallel between education and health care, massive inequality, growing inequality, growing corporate interest, um, and a real social harm. Your title is hopeful, sort of like Jane Jacobs, the death and life, you end with the life part. Uh, if it is a matter of socioeconomic injustice, what do we do? Well, it is a matter of socioeconomic inequality. And we're, I mean, every place where there is very, very low performance just happens to be an inner city with concentrated poverty and also concentrated racial segregation. And so uh, when charter operators come in and they skim off the ablest kids and they say, look, we have a miracle on our hands, um, it's not a miracle for everybody. It's a miracle for the kids they skim. So what skimmed. do we do? I think that we really have to, uh, first of all, insist that charter schools accept regulation, uh, that they can't grade their own tests, and some do, uh, that they have to accept a fair share of kids who have uh, disabilities, who don't speak English, who uh, are low-performing, that they can't kick out the low-performers and bounce them back to the regular public schools. And public education policy? The public education policy, I think, has to be, first of all, we have to, have, we have to get rid of high-stakes testing. High stakes testing is a very pernicious policy which No Child Left Behind is now inflicted on the entire country and the Obama-Duncan administration are tightening the screws on high stakes testing. Uh, it distorts everything about the schools. It, it sets up the wrong criteria of judgment. It's leading to massive institutionalized fraud. Uh, New York State's tests were just revealed uh, just this past week to be fraudulent tests. I mean, the scores have been flying through the roof, but none of them are, are real. Damn. So we're, we're lying to our kids. Check out the book, The Death and Life of the Great American School System by Diane Ravitch. There's a link at our website and more of her writing at thenation.com.